Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind the scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. Hard to Tell Podcast, episode 184, Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca. Choo. Here. Uh, how you doing, man? You good? Doing it's hot, all it's right. Hot it's, it's hot out here. It's hot out here in New York. Yeah, I don't, I'm wearing a hat indoors, but that's because I need a haircut. But <laughs> <laughs> it's not a smart move in the summer because it's like going to be 95 this week. 95, so, yeah. 95 with the fitted on. But this week we got a guest. Uh, I believe this is his fourth time on the podcast if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he's done a bunch of other stuff. One of our favorite MCs, repping Brooklyn to the fullest. My man, Sky Zoo, new album out, All the Brilliant Things. Sky, peace, what's peace. up, man? How you doing, what's bro? What's going on? What's the deal? Ain't much, man. We, we're just maintaining, man. Maintaining, uh, getting excited for that next Knicks season, which we'll, <laughs> we'll get to We'll get to soon. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We're we excited for the offseason. We'll get to that soon. First, we got to talk. You got a new album out. Uh, all the brilliant things. We've had some chance to sit with it for a little bit. But I, talk to me about, you kind of talked to me about this before, but talk to me a little bit about the process of creating this album and going into this because there's a very strong topic of gentrification and how it particularly it impacts Brooklyn and New York City. But Work. talk to me about what the inspiration was to do this and and why you wanted to tell the story on this album. Yeah, I was inspired just from uh, just kind of being fed up walking around the neighborhood, walking around the city and seeing things change so much. And, you know, between gentrification and then cultural appropriation, which is another topic all over the album, it, it kind of plays like 50-50 or 60-40 as far as the w- what the concept of the album is. And then the two go hand in hand. So it becomes one concept within the two. Um, it came from just kind of being fed up. You know, you just, you living in the neighborhood, you moving around and things are just so different. And, and yeah, I kind of was over it. You know, I've been over it for a while and it just got to a boiling point. You know, it wasn't really a specific moment. It kind of was slowly but surely building up. You know, you see a boulder and, you know, you, you hammer away at it. You chip away like you pick at it. Like, boom, boom, you know, little by little. They're just picking away at us, man. And and I got to that point where I was like, all right, that's it. So, you know, I just wanted to speak on it and give people some background, give people some heads up to it. And a lot of people in the neighborhood, a lot of people in the hood and all that don't, they don't really get it. They don't understand it. They think, you know, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. Oh, we, we live here. It is what it is. Oh, it's not as bad as we think. Uh, you know, so this is giving them information and, and, and stirring up conversation and dialogue and, you know, things of that nature where now you can be more educated on what's going on and you can figure out how you want to move from there. What both of us being Brooklyn Knights. Um, and even Brian, he lives in Ridgewood, Queens, bordering, you know, Bushwick. So he's kind of seen it too. Could you explain for people some of the things you've seen over the years? It's not just seeing white folks there, right, Sky? In, right. It's, in, it's, in, not, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not about that. Yeah. I, I think I know where you're going. I, I ain't trying, you know. Yeah, no, no, it's all good. Um, yeah. It's just, you know, when neighborhoods change and they don't include the people who were there before the change, you know, mm. um, you have situations where mom and pop businesses get closed down because of condos being built. You have situations where businesses that used to serve the community, whether they would hire, you know, teenagers to work there, whether they gave back, gave back, you know, summer programs or, you know, uh, lunch in the summer, free lunch, or, you know, whether they donated, you know, within the community or whatever it is, all that stuff goes away for a yoga studio and, and a condo, a high rise building with, you know, with a doorman out front and, you know, the supermarket that served the neighborhood for 50, 60 years has now become somewhat of a Whole Foods, you know, a, a knockoff mm-hmm. Whole Foods one of one type spot. And none of those things serve the community. They're not things that the community can afford or understand or know what they're about. 
And that's what it really comes down to. I've seen barbershops close that have been there forever. I've seen, you know, mom and pop stores. I've seen, you know, food spots that just turn into stuff that the neighborhood doesn't understand, doesn't need, doesn't want, and can't benefit from. And it doesn't service the neighborhood, you know. And then you have the people that move in that look at the people that used to be there as if we're not going to be here longer. So we walk by each other, walking dogs, crossing paths. And it's like, I don't got to acknowledge you. You're not going to be here in a year or two. And that's sad, you know. So those are the things that that all you know that that all play into it. It's not it, it's not really about a race thing because, you know, it is on the surface, but it's mm-hmm. not. You know, it's not about that. There's a lot of people who don't look like us on this screen, who move into the neighborhood who are awesome. You know, I know a bunch of them. Next door neighbors that super cool. You know, downstairs the guy downstairs, the dude next door, the lady upstairs, super cool. You know, mad cool. They don't come in the neighborhood trying to change it. They come in the neighborhood enjoying what brought them there in the first place. And that's all we ask, you know, come on in and join in with us, but don't try to change the menu. Once you walk into the restaurant, knowing what type of restaurant it was when you got there, you know, that facts. I mean, you you talked about this all over the album. So my question will probably, if my question is already answered to some degree, but what I will ask is like, do you see a way that New York city can come back to where it was previously or something close to that? Or are they, or is the city like too far gone with the high rises? We're getting the mom and pop shots up, pop shops out, excuse me. And things of that nature. Are they too far gone to like get back to where it was? It seems a little too far gone because a lot of it is about, you know, when it comes to gentrification, it's about money. It's about the economical side of it. The first thing would be trying to buy back the neighborhood. Well, who has 3 million for a brownstone out the blue who has, you know what I mean? Like, who, who can do these things and jump in front of these developers and put a firm together and start up something to buy it back and, and jump in front of that? You know, like that's incredibly hard to do. You know, it's about what we do have, making the most of it and, you know, knowing who's coming in the neighborhood and really educating the people that are coming into the neighborhood to say, OK, we can't afford what it takes to keep you all out. But why don't y'all understand why it's important for things to kind of stay the same as we want? You know, it's not about the crime. Nobody wants crime. It's not, well, this neighborhood used to be awful and you just want it to stay awful. Not at all. I'd be a fool to say that. What it is, is how do we clean up the neighborhood while keeping the soul and the culture of the neighborhood intact? That's mm-hmm. what it really comes down to. It's not about, you know, we used to be a shootout here every day. We got to keep that. That's that's ignorant. <laughs> that's ridiculously right. ignorant. You know, and anybody who gets that from this is an imbecile, you know, um, it's about how do we clean up the neighborhood because the people who live through all those shootouts deserve for the neighborhood to be clean, deserve mm. for the neighborhood to be peaceful, deserve for the block party to not get shut down because somebody was popping off. How do we do that and keep everybody here who deserves it and have other people move in and join in with us? That's what it comes down to. And the first step is educating everybody. And that's why this record is extremely important. I think one of the things, Sky, you were trying to educate people on, maybe if they're coming in, they're not from Brooklyn, they're not from Bed-Stuy, not from Flatbush uh, like me, but coming in and saying that, hey, there are things that are brilliant in in our spaces that you can enjoy without trying to push push that away. What what has been sort of the reception that you've heard from people on the album where you're also highlighting the things that make our neighborhoods beautiful? It's been amazing. You know, it's been 100 percent a landslide. You know, everybody's been going crazy for it. People who look like us, people who don't look like us, people who you would think I'm talking about, like the people who that looks like somebody who this this subject this is about. And, you know, they're loving it. Like, it's been insane, man. Um, I'm blessed to say every time I drop a record, the response is through the roof. Every time I drop a record, the response is crazy. People are losing their minds. and, And that's a that's not a flex, man. That's a blessing, you know. But this one, this one has been that times 10. You know, it's really, really, really been a different ball game on this. And I'm just proud that it connected, you know, for people to get it like that means it connected. Yeah, you see it connected with people. And look, you even talked about, we talked about people that so many times on the album, you, I was laughing because you kept bringing up uh, PBRs and, you know, pe- people drinking that and the sort of the that culture coming yeah. outside and bringing it into the, it was a great I would say metaphor because it's real, right? Like these are the kinds of things you're now seeing sold in bodegas, these certain kinds of beers that you might not have seen before. And it kind (laughs) of infiltrates the the, the culture. Do you think that, because your album, I think, is putting an awareness, as you said, out there, right? Do Mm -hmm. Do you hope that people take from that and then are inspired to sort of protect their neighborhoods, grow their neighborhoods, amplify their voices in that way, the way you have on this record? hundred percent. You know, a big part of gentrification is that 
it gets so cheap to buy the neighborhoods because the neighborhoods are so bad mm. that it gets so cheap to buy it. If I could buy this pair of Jordans for fifty dollars and flip them on Goat for five hundred, why wouldn't I? You know, so we're letting the neighborhood turn into a fifty dollar pair of Jordans when it's a two hundred dollar pair of Jordans retail. We're letting the neighborhood turn into a fifty dollar pair that somebody could come in, y'all. Let me drop fifty bones real quick, boom, boom. I'm gonna mm. flip this for five, six hundred dollars on Goat and be straight. That's what's happening. So first of all, we gotta uphold the community on our own. We gotta clean up the community, build the community better so that the, the property value does raise on the community. And it is harder for people to come in. People may have second thoughts like, damn, I thought this, I thought I could buy this building for such and such. This thing then went up, you know what I mean? And, you know, we, we, we gotta, we gotta clean up, you know, all of, of, of our neighborhoods and our communities on our own first, you know, we gotta continue to put more and more pride into where we from and where we live at, you know? And then from there, we could just continue to build, you know, you're working on building something, building in your neighborhood. You don't got to be in somebody else's hood or you don't got to drop that on this. How about you build something right there, you know, and, and and it'll give back more than what you put down on it. You know, we, we got to have the presence of mind to jump in front of that first. Facts. Now, this was one you told me that, uh, you know, you spent a lot of time you sat with in terms of the writing process of, yeah. of this album. So in terms of the writing process, and everything, what are, what are some of your favorite tracks that you recorded? What track means the most to you? Out of, on this oh, project, man. you know, their songs are like kids when you make an album. You know, they're all your favorite. You know, but um, I mean, man, some of the ones that really stand out. I mean, soft eyes, uh, plugs and connections. I love that I one. Supposed, I was supposed to be a trap rapper, culturish for sure, without a doubt. Uh, Best eyes burning, bodega flowers, something to believe in easily, something to believe in. Uh, free jewelry, man, it's crazy. Like all of them, you know, but but um. <laughs> Yeah, but but those are definitely off top what what really stick out. But every day that that lineup changes. Every day it changes. Yeah. I, I want to ask about uh I was supposed to be a trap rapper cuz I do remember when we had you on. I think this was after Retropolitan or maybe even in celebration of us where you said that <laughs> or you joked that, you know, if you came out with like an actual trap record, people would be like, yo, what the fuck is this? You know what I mean? Because that's not really what you do. And then toward the end, you sort of flipped it a little bit and, you know, had that a little bit on there. And, you know, I thought it was like, I kind of laughed out loud when I heard it because I remembered that conversation that we had when you were up here. So right. uh, could you sort of just break down the process of that in particular? And I guess what made you want to do that? Yeah. Well, the record came from a conversation that I had with, um, but one of my day one guys, man, he had just got home from jail. I actually mentioned him on Rich Rhetoric as well when I said, you know, um, my man caught a bad one, son. Lawyers is fighting. He bit it, came home and called me while I was writing Reunited, like the best song on the second. Ooh, shit. That's, you know, I was talking about my man. I was writing Rich Rhetoric. Mm. And my man called me. Yo, yo, son, I just got home. Boom, boom, boom. I just got out the joint, whatever, whatever. So I wrote him in the record because I was in the middle of writing that record when the phone rang. So now fast forward, maybe like a month later. He hit my horn and he was like, yo, bro, I'm trying to get into the music shit. I got these little drill kids I'm trying to run around with. And, um, you know, you the music man out of all of us in the neighborhood, you the music man. So if you got any advice on who to get with and how to do this shit, how to work the industry, I don't know nothing about it. All I know about is being inside the joint. But let me know, you know, if there's anything you can help me with. And I was like, yeah, of course, like whatever you need. And he was like, you know, I know you do the, the backpack, skateboard kind of Joey shit, you know, those was his exact words. <laughs> and I was like, bro, I never made a skateboard record in my life. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and we laughed and he was like, nah, 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 I'm just saying like, you know, you do the more traditional real hip hop shit. And I know I'm trying to fuck with the, the drill mainstream shit, you know, the shit that these kids is on. But, and I, I knew what he was trying to say. So I wasn't offended at all. It made me laugh. Um, I knew what he was trying to say. What he was trying to say was you're more of a traditional underground rapper and i'm trying to do this this drill kind of typical mainstream shit mm. to paper and whatever whatever and it just made me think people would never think that this guy is one of my closest friends when they listen to my music and they think dilla and they think you know uh whatever you know what i mean all that great stuff you know that 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 we that we thrive off of and that my career has been kind of side by side with when you name artists who are in my kind of circle and you wouldn't think Somebody like this is one of my closest friends that I grew up with and I was running around with and I was kind of in that circle and in that mix with, you know, um, 
So I, it made me come up with this idea. Like that's where the concept of the actual song was. And it's as blatant as the title. I was supposed to be a trap rapper. If you look at the guys I grew up with, the world I grew up in, the neighborhood I was in, the stuff I saw, the stuff that, I mean, I used to be in my man crib, I'm playing NBA Live and he's chopping up rocks and we 15. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So like those guys don't go out, go on and make, you know, to do shows at Blue Note and make records with jazz bands. And yeah. Those guys don't do that. Those guys make records that represent the world they was in when they were sitting there playing live and their man was chopping up. Like, right. you know what I'm saying? So yeah. that's, what, that's what that came from. So that's what I'm explaining on the record. Like to my fans, this could have went a whole different way. I chose to go this way and I'm, I'm proud of it because I love the world that I'm in, the music I make, the jazz influence and all that. This could have went a whole nother way if I stuck to the world that I'm from, you know, and yeah, that's yeah. what the record's about. And then at the end, I did the record. I did the first part of the record and I was done with it. And I said to myself, man, if I say this, people are going to be like, word, you're supposed to be a trap rapper? Bullshit. So I had to show them. <laughs> you know what I mean? I had to show them. But that's why I made a trap record at the uh, end. So I yeah. called my man Sam Illy and I was like, yo, you got some trap shit? Like he does a whole bunch of different shit. He did Everybody's Fine. He did um, short money on peddler themes. You know, he Pedal did a thing. Mm. So his sound isn't really known for being trapped, but he does everything and he messes around with everything. And I was like, "Yo, you got some trap shit?" And he was like, "Yeah, I got a couple. Let me send you something." And he sent me a couple joints, and I picked that one, and I wrote it on the spot. It was like three in the morning. You know, I, I record in the crib, so it was three in the morning. I'm down here in the basement, and I just pulled it up. I wrote that shit in like ten minutes, and I just boom, I just recorded it and was done with it. And I was like, "Yeah, this is great." You know, I wanted it to be kind of typical and ignorant in a trap sense but then i also wanted it to be witty and lyrical and you know and still have entendres you know what i'm saying like like there's a part nobody really catches it and i said um uh, paper mate like the boat coming dot don't look plug thank god how the snow coming thank god how the stove jumping name another tag team that could stand still but show will run it what i'm saying there like name another tag team that could get better with this with this coke shit I'm talking about me and God because I just said, thank mm. God, snow coming. Thank God, how the stove jumping. Name another tag team that can stand still, but show run it. See, so I'm like, thank, name another two people, me and God, who could get more busy with this coke. Who oh. would say that? Like, <laughs> right. That's the right. most ignorant, blasphemous shit ever. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. who would say that? You know what I mean? So that's why, that's why I said that. You know what I mean? Like, because when you think about trap, first of all, I like trap. I'm not, you know, I, yeah. I, I like rap. And, you know, some of it is really, really great. I think Migos is super dope. Like, I think Migos is awesome. Um, I think Lil Baby is great. Uh, who else? I think, um, what's son name? Oh, man. Oh, man. I forget son name. He got the joint. Oh, man. I don't listen to trap every day, so I'm not as, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, what's that record? Where are you man? from? Do you know? Do you know where he's from, more or less? Somewhere down south. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, 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 used to, he used to be with. He used to be with Megan. He used to be with Megan. The baby? Nah. Um. Some before that. He used to be with Megan. He with Megan. Uzi? Nah, I don't think Uzi was with Megan. Um. Nah. What's up? Nah. Tennessee. Tennessee. Dang, I don't know, but Shit. but he got a dope joint. He got a, he got a real dope joint that's always on. Uh, hip hop nation and all that now, but anyway, long story right. short, um, <laughs> I try to I, think who's I, like from that. I like some of that stuff, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. but you know, so I think a lot of it is really a lot of trap is like really blatant, like yo, that's so outlandish. How could you say that? You know what I mean? So I wanted yeah. to have those moments in there. So I'm saying, name another tag team better than me and God getting busy with this coke, like that's nuts, you know what I mean? So the shit like that, so I still wanted to have double entendres and and all that type of stuff that you got to catch but still make it trap and still make it all that yes my man just wrote in the chat money bag yo that's exactly that, that was it money bag he, got, he, got, got, a real, he got a real dope joint running around right now forgot the name of it but he got a real dope joint. it's always on hip -hop oh nation. i'm forgetting the name of the joint because somebody played it for me the other day it was actually my man's we was, we was out somewhere he played it for me literally a couple days ago and it was like yeah. i was feeling it. it was a dope joint too yeah he got a real dope joint it's so like, he's, he's, he's talking about how he don't like nobody and he likes to be by himself that kind yeah, of vibe yeah yeah, yeah 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 that's, that's, really that's the joint. Shit. Yep. Yeah, 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 he's, um, yeah he, he got a joint so you know there's joints out there that are really dope you know and it's still it's still a a, a realm and a subculture of hip hop you know right. what I mean? So yeah. we gotta respect that. We really gotta respect that. Absolutely. So anyway, yeah. so that was the science. To give all the way back to the question, that was the science behind 
I was supposed to be the trap rapper. And the crazy thing is the response on it has been so bananas and people are going crazy for it. People are hitting me on, on online, like, you know, comments and all that, like, yo, you got to make a trap album now. Yep. You know, <laughs> it's so crazy. Oh, what? That's I'm how like, it starts. Yo, yo, it's been everywhere. Everybody's like, yo, you got to make a trap album now. You got to do it. I'm like, I highly doubt I'm going to do that. Like, I'm not I doing was, it. I was just about to ask if you, you know what, do it. though? But you know what? People are people are also going to be, especially because you're from Brooklyn, people are going to be asking you for the drill records now because right. Brooklyn you know drill is going and crazy. The thing is, I feel like if I did something like that, it would come off as a parody or a reach. Like, it wouldn't seem authentic. It's like, mm. oh, now you want to make a trap record. because You know, like, I, I, and I don't yeah. respect that. So I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I mean, you know, I trap, uh, I ghostwrite trap stuff, you know, so that right. I'm already kind of doing it, just people don't know. But And that's why I was able to do that joint. Like, it came to me quick, easy, because I already, you know, I, I ghostwrite that stuff sometimes. So, you know, it was whatever. So, um, but yeah, that, that was the science behind that. And I had fun doing that joint. And, and when, when I do it at the shows, people bug out. People love it. There's, love it, yeah. there's no flack coming back on that, you know, which is crazy. Like, when it came out, nobody was like, yo, why you put that stupid trap joint at the end? <laughs> nah, everybody's like, yo, that record is crazy. Yo, the way it flipped at the end and he did the trap and he killed it. Like, People love it. Yeah, it was well, dope. It, it, it really, was dope because I didn't expect it too. Like I didn't right. expect it to do it too either. That's why I liked it. Yeah, go I ahead. Was gonna, I was gonna say because it's it stands out because it's it, the sound is more unique to like anything else on the album, pretty much. Of course. There's, a, of course. there's actually another joint, Sky, that I wanted to ask you about culture-ish, which mm-hmm. right now might be my favorite, but with a Sky Zoo album that always changes, <laughs> you know, and after a few years. That, that's the beauty of it, bro. Right. So, right. But culture is like, what was the process behind that? Because I think in terms of just the rapping, the bars, just the verses, like those were the ones that stuck out to me the most that I, you know, was replaying over and over, catching yeah. lines here and there. And that sort of resonate with me in a specific way. Yeah. Um, culture is was the last record I did for the album. Uh, mm. We got it done. I think January, January 21, like January of this year. That was the last mm. album. Uh, that was the last record I did for the album. Um, yeah, I love that record. Everything I'm saying on it, everything I'm talking about, there's cultural appropriation stuff all over the album, but that one is obviously the most blatant. Like that is right. literally called culture-ish. So that's the one where I'm really going for it. I'm really gonna for their head on that one. You know, Supreme Soul for two Billy looked at my closet like they should split that with me. For every collab T soul for 250, and every face adorned on it resembling me. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. out the gate, the first four bars. I'm like, this is the problem. Because if that if it was a clothing line owned by somebody that looked like you and I, would we be able to resell that shirt for two fifty with our face on it? Could we could right. we call up one of these rappers or entertainers or ball players and say, "Yo, we doing a shoot. We want to put your face on the shirt, and we're gonna sling that." Mm-hmm. Would they be with it or would it be nah? Well, I got my own clothing line, so nah, not really. But they do it for them. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. and I got Wow Supreme. You know, I, that's why I, I threw myself in it, looked at my closet like they should split that with me. I'm pointing the finger at myself like I opened the closet. I got all kind of supreme. You know what I mean? So I'm like, but well, damn, what, what am I doing? You know, like mm. what's up? Like I'm I'm no better than who I'm getting ready to talk about. And that's the, the the that's the start of the record. So that's the beauty of it. You know, and it just breaks it all down. That's that's one of my favorite records on the album. Yeah, it's it's, it's a strong, strong moment. I got I to gotta thank you, um, Sky, because you uh, my, one of my favorite joints, I just think it's it's sonically why I love it. It's something to believe in. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I love the Roy Ayer sample. Anytime somebody flip, who did the production on that, on something to believe oh, in? That was my man, Mirk. Yo, shout out to him, because I love, I love what he did with the sample and how he flipped it. Anybody touching the, everybody loves the sunshine sample. I just love it. And I, Raheem on the hook is dope, too. Yeah. Um, I, I really like that. You always want to bring back your jazz influences. I know you love Roy Ayers too, the way I do uh, as as well. Like how how important is it you for always still to continue to have that sound on these projects? You know, you talked about it's always been a big part of you, but you've always been pushing it forward and having your producers just you know flip these samples really well, these jazz samples. Just how important is that to you to continue that sound? It's extremely important. Uh, one, I love jazz. You know, it's a part of my DNA at this point. I love jazz. I listen to more jazz than hip hop. And two, it's part of it's my sound. You know, when you think about Tribe Called Quest, they have a sound. When you think mm-hmm. about uh, who could we name? Money Bag Yo, he has a sound. You know, when you think about Future and Migos, they have a sound. When you think about, uh, you know, Griselda, they have a sound. You know, 
Sky Zoo has a sound, and that's a part of it. The jazz elements, not jazz in the sense of jazz with soft drums and all that type of stuff. Nah, my sound is jazz loops or jazz feels with hard, dirty corner store drums, mid-tempo, nothing crazy slow, nothing drumless, mid-tempo, breakbeat stuff with jazz stuff, but then you, you can add some 808s for a, a, a current, you know, 2021 feel and then adding the live instrumentation on top of that so you got the break beats you got the jazz sample you got live jazz instrumentation to enhance it and then you got 808s all put together that's the sky zoo sound you yeah know? I, I love it i know i know you just dropped this one i know you're always thinking of head have you thought about what your next project is or what you might want to talk about has that even entered your not mind at, at this point honestly not at all um i'm just so in the moment with this one yeah. You know, I worked on this album for a year and a half. It was off and on. I wasn't writing and recording every day for a year and a half, you know. Uh, but it was August 2019 up until January 2021. So not at all. You know, it'll hit me at some point. But yeah. right now I'm just running around. I'm on Zoom five times a day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> I'm, I'm doing these like five, ten times a day. Literally, I'm, I'm kind of Zoomed out. But it's all good. I, you know, it's love, man. I appreciate anybody want to zoom with me so you know um i'm on zoom all day you know the show game is picking back up because covid is you know we're start slowly starting to get back to some sort of normalcy so you got that element um i'm busy you know with the family you know what i mean so of course i haven't really thought about the next uh the next record you know i'm waiting to see what the knicks gonna do with these trades that takes up 40 percent of my day <laughs> so you know i haven't really thought about another album yet you know what i mean nah i i hear you before before we get to that too one of the things on the album i believe this was on i believe it's on the last track you talked about how you considered retirement and you talked yeah. to you talked to fonte uh mm-hmm. about this and like how how real was that for you to the point where you're like i'm gonna leave this this rap game behind and move on to to whatever else you you want to do it was super, super real. You know, um, I was just sitting back for a while contemplating things and like, you know, I, I've done a lot. I have a career. I have a catalog. I have a legacy. I've seen the world 20 times over, multiple passports. I bought my house, multiple cars, money in the bank. My kid's room looks like Toys R Us, all off music, <laughs> all off music. And that and that's not a flex. That's a blessing, you know, all off music. Facts. If I left right now, am I happy with what I've achieved. And I was like, yeah, I am. And then I thought about the things that would say, okay, well, if you're happy with what you've achieved, you would leave. Now, why, what are the things that you don't like that make you want to leave? Are you just tired? Do you not have it no more? No, I still got it. You know, the the pen is flying as you can hear on the album and, Mm. you know, freestyles and little things I've been doing. I mean, I put up a verse a couple of days ago on the gram. I just, I was at my man Bishop Lamont house and he was like, yo, Sky, yo, you know, working on some, some some music, man, and get a verse. And I was like, yeah, and I just wrote a verse on the spot at his house in 20 minutes, people losing it. Like, so the pen is still flying. I say that to say the pen is still flying. So it wasn't that. I always said if I couldn't rhyme no more, like if I write and it take too long to come out and I don't like what comes out and everybody has uh, kind of, you know, little funks, you know, writer's block. Everybody, I don't care who you are. You mm-hmm. can be Jay-Z, Nas, I don't care who you are. Everybody has a writer's block at some point. Facts. We're human beings. It is what it is. But if that writing block, if, if that writer's block turns out to be a month, you know, writer's block could be a week, maybe two. If that writer's block turns out to be a month or two, that's when it's like, yo, it might be over. You know, so that wasn't happening. Thank God. You know what I mean? So it wasn't like I was in a funk writing wise or anything. It just was like the industry and looking at things and the way the way the game is played and things I was over, you know, since mm. I've become a dad. I've been less and less industry. I've, let me let me re, let me rephrase that. I've never been industry. Let me rephrase that. Since becoming a dad, I've cared less about running around in the industry. That's mm. the way I would rephrase it. I've never been the industry type, but I knew. Okay, you got to go to this event. You got to go to that event. You got to make sure you got connections with this liquor company. Make sure you got connections with this clothing line. Make sure you got connections with these DJs. Yo, since my son was born, I don't care about none of that. You know what I mean, mm. like. And every day that goes by, the less and less I care about it. I really just care about making this music, recording it, putting it out, and turning on Daniel Tiger for this kid. That's it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> that's really no, it. I, 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 can, I can, I dig that, and I can that's relate really to that. It. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. that's what my life consists of. Like, 
you know, honest kids juice boxes and like, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> you know, uh, my kid loves Nature Valley almond butter bars. He's like running through them like water. Like that's mm. the stuff that concerns me now. Like I don't care about going to this event or, you know, yo, I got to make sure I got somebody at so-and-so so they can send me a box. I don't care about none of that. Right, you know, it's right. cool. I used to get all kind of sneakers. I used to show up to the crib. It'd be 10 pairs of Jordans in a box. You know what I mean? Like for years, you know, I used to get all kind of clothes, you know, call so-and-so clothing line or email them or go to their office and get bags. You know what I mean? Or I'm going to go on tour. Heads to send me boxes of clothes. And that stuff is great. Like it's a blessing. But a lot of people like they push for that. Like that stuff defines them. Like mm. damn, I don't have no connection with so-and-so. I'm not popping. Nah, man, you popping if, if the music you're making is touching people and you're making an impact and you provide it for your family off that, you popping. You know word, what I mean? Like word. other stuff is whatever. But we got we got kids out here thinking they're not popping because they can't call Supreme and get a box. Mm. Supreme ain't giving nobody a box unless it's Bieber. You know what I mean? So like, <laughs> you know, I'm using this example, but you know what hey, I mean? Right. Yeah, we got you. You know, or, or Tyler, you know, and shout right. out to Tyler. New album is really dope. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, so don't think you ain't popping because you can't holler at somebody at Supreme and get a box. No, you're not popping if your music isn't touching people and you can't make money off your music. Anybody, and this is for people watching who are up and coming artists, up and coming MCs or whatever. Everybody, yo, my, yo, my, my joint is streaming, my numbers, boom, boom, boom. Listen, man, you know how easy it is to give away something for free? Word. Ridiculous. Word. Easy. Word. If you can make money off your art, then you popping. Word. If you can go out there and sell vinyl, sell CDs, and okay, CDs is dead sell apple music uh you know downloads anybody will stream your joint i'm already paying 9.99 a month oh i'm let me add your joint i added it i don't like it let me get rid of it but it, you can't if you buy somebody album for ten dollars on itunes you can't give you can't call itunes or hit itunes and get a refund for that right you, know what I mean? like, right. Or you go to urban outfitters and buy the vinyl or you go to amoeba or one of these record stores and buy the vinyl rough trade or whatever you can't you know, buy the vinyl, take it home, listen to it for a week and take it back. Yo, I ain't like this. Let me get it back. But you could add somebody record on your stream, your Apple Music, your Spotify, your title, and then you don't like it, get rid of it. Like, yeah, I ain't really like this. Let me get rid of it. So yeah. it's nothing to give somebody something for free. Yeah. Nothing. Prove that you can make some money off your shit. That's when you pop it. So I, I say all that to say, like, none of that stuff mean nothing, man. Like, you know, so long, I feel like I went on, on, on a rant. Nah, that's, that's fine, bro. Going back to the question, just the way the game is played, I just kind of over it. And I was like, man, I'm over this, man. I don't know if I want to do this no more. I love making music. I love creating. It's the stuff that happens when you get out of the booth that I'm I'm just not really into no more. You know, I don't want to play the game no more. But then something said call Tay. I don't know what it was. And me and Tay are real cool. We don't talk every day, but yeah. we're real cool. That's my man. You know, he was one of the first ones when I was going to North Carolina in 2005, 2006, you know, he was there, you know what I mean? Justice League, Ninth, and all that stuff. Obviously, he was a part of that. And we've always been really, really cool. Something said, call Tay. And I called him. Yeah, I text him, yo, you free? Yeah, yeah, I'm free, bro. What up? Gave him a call. And we talked for like three hours. Just about mad random stuff. You know, it wasn't all about that. It was, how's your family? How's this? How's that? Yo, the new album, this, that, you know, all that type of stuff. And we were just chit-chatting for three hours, damn near. And, um, you know, and I brought it up. I was like, yo, man, I think I might tap out of this soon. And then he just, you know, he just gave me some good advice, like you heard on the album. He was like, yo, if you want to do it, let it be because you want to do it, not because of the game or somebody pushing you out. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, you go on your terms. Whenever you're ready, go on your terms. terms. And and that was it. That was the advice. You know, it was like, don't, don't let these motherfuckers tell you when to go. You go when you're ready. And I slept on it, and I was like, you got a point. You know what I mean? And, and, and that, as you heard on the record. What's up, listeners and supporters of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast? We need some help from you, and it won't take up too much of your time. As we grow, we always want to hear your feedback, so take a minute or two to fill out a short, anonymous survey. The survey link is right in the episode notes for this podcast. It's easy and takes less than five minutes. As always, we thank you for your continued support. It was just Friday. It was the 25th anniversary of, you know, one of our favorite albums, Reasonable Doubt. Yeah. Um, that's an album. B and I were talking about this before we got on here, and you—you yeah. you probably remember. You remember when this dropped in in '96? Mm -hmm. Some people were. I don't know about you. I remember I was one of the people up on Jay early. I remember mm -hmm. a lot of friends around me were up on him late. I remember eighth grade. I'm, I got the Reasonable Doubt CD. And people weren't really bumping it like that. 
Yeah. I know that album means a lot to you too. Could could you talk right. about what it means to to you and yeah. how it still resonate? How does it still resonate for you 25 years later? Oh man, you know, I um I was one of the ones, I don't want to say I got on it late. I got on it when it was out, you know. Um Jay came out and then a week later Nas came out. Yep, but, it, was uh, it was written. It was yep. written. A week later. And Nas was stupid popping. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> Jay was indie. He was on Priority. Uh, he was on the radio a little bit in New York, but that was kind of it. Nas was stupid popping. Columbia yep. opened up the bag. He had the single with Lauren Hill. I say all that to say, if we being honest, everybody was on Nas. Everybody was on It Was Written. You oh, yeah. I mean? No no, no doubt. I had copped It Was Written before. Yeah, no doubt. Right. If you was in New York, if you was in New York, you was on Jay because the streets and he was being from New York... But Nas was everywhere because he was on a major. That's yep. the difference between indie and major, you know, and as somebody who's been indie their whole life, I know what it is. Everybody was on Nas, you know, So and it was a week later. So that's why the album kind of got lost in the shuffle as far as the commercial side of it. But obviously from the creative side and just how great the album is, I mean, the album is absolutely fantastic. You know, it's absolutely fantastic. I said all that previous stuff to say, because I know you asked, you know, if I was on it earlier or later. I was on it in the moment, but I definitely was listening to it was written a little more at the time. You know, mm -hmm. one, I was 14, 96. I was 14. I think I was going on 14. Yeah, because if that was June, my birthday in December, I was 13 and a half. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, like, I understood it, but I didn't understand it. Because right. that was life, I was 13. You know what I mean? Like, that, I wasn't out there, you know, meeting with Poppy and all that. Like, that. <laughs> I was 13. You know what I mean? Like, you know, so... I understood it, but it wasn't for me to really, really, really understand because I was 13, you know, so 13 and a half, whatever. Um, but when you get older, you look back at art and you get it. You read certain books, you listen to certain albums, you watch certain movies, you know, and you get it, you know, and, and that was one of those things. So I was on it when it first came out because he was rapping crazy. The beats was crazy. Biggie was on it. So I was all about that. You know what I mean? So like I was on it for sure. But um I was I was I was on it was written more at the time, but I think within a, a couple months, I think by the time I got into high school, which was a couple months later, I really continued to just delve into that album. And that's yeah. when it was just like, yo, this is out of control, you know, because, again, I got all the lyricism. I got all that, but I couldn't relate to all those stories, nor was I supposed to. I was 13. I wasn't supposed to relate to him talking about the evils between slinging to somebody and being addicted to the money the same way the fiend is addicted to the rocks. Yeah. But I wasn't supposed to get that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm a kid. So, but my pops was all over it. My pops yeah. being a guy, even though he was a jazz head, being a guy who was from the street and in the street, my pops was all over it. Like I remember he bought the maxi single for dead presidents like right away. You know what mm. I mean? Like, mm. My pops was all over Reasonable Doubt. Um, still is. Still bumps it all the time. Goes to the gym and plays the evils and all that stuff. So, what's your what's your favorite track? What's your favorite track on that album? Regrets. Mine too. Mine too. Yeah, regrets. Regrets has always <laughs> been my favorite track. Yeah, regrets has always been that. I mean, and that's a, that's an example, Sky, of a story that like just the regrets that Jay had, and he's talking about being in the streets and the life and everything, didn't hit me the same way when I was thirteen. That's 14. what I'm saying. It wasn't supposed but, to hit us. We was yeah. Kidding. You was in the eighth grade, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like we, uh, yeah, June. So that was um, that was right around eighth grade graduation. So yeah, we the same age. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, we the same. You know what yeah. So like, what we wasn't supposed to get that like that. Nah. We got what was on the radio. So you know, the joint with Foxy. You know, ain't no. Of course, we got that. You know, we was all over that. The girls was into that. Um, you know, that presidents was on the radio. Feeling it. The finest was on the radio and we was right. loving that. So, you know, we was in we was into it because of those things. And we was like, Yeah, we gotta get the J joint. But then when Nas dropped, we was already familiar with Nas because of Illmatic. I had already had Illmatic memorized by heart for the past two years at that Same. point. <laughs> Same. It was written drop. It was like, yo, fake thug, no love. You get the slug, CB4, Gusto. And it was like, yo, 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 hold up. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> he, he was responding that. And, and I got every record. And I was like, yo, this guy just did a record about a gun and blah, 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 blah. Like, so it was just like, yo, what are we, what are we doing? Like, you know what I mean? So, um, but no, just to bring it back to Reasonable Doubt. Nah, man, Reasonable Doubt is, is, is artwork. It is absolutely a classic. There's nothing I can say about it that, people don't know it hasn't already been said but i'll still say it you know it's absolutely wonderful it's why i went and redid it 
and and paid my homage to it. And um, yeah, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful piece, you know. That's and it's, and it's also like I mean that's something that at least from people that I know because I was really young when Reasonable Doubt came out, so I didn't yeah. get onto it way later. I know my brother, my older brother, was listening to it uh, around that time because he was sort of one of these early J fans who right. liked his freestyles and shit like that when right. he was rapping fast and the Big L features and things like that. Mm-hmm. But most people I know didn't really like go back to that album. They said until like 2001. When the blueprint right. came out, and right. that was the year that Reasonable Doubt went platinum. Coincidentally, the year that Illmatic also went platinum right. uh, because Stillmatic came out. Right. So I wanted to ask, like, do you have an album in your discography that a lot of people like go like hit you up about all these years later, like something very early on in your career that uh, I guess resonates with people now? It's so all of them, man. Like some people, some people got on board with a Dream Deferred, which was two albums mm. and four mixtapes later. Some people got on board on Retropolitan, you know. Some mm. people hit me the other day, like, yo, the first time I heard of you was Retropolitan, and I went crazy and I went back and, and listened to everything. <laughs> yeah, that, that's 10 years back, you know what I'm saying? So that's a lot of music. I drop every single year. Mm. You know what I mean? So you gotta go get the easy truth, you gotta get music for my friends, you gotta get live from the tape deck, you gotta get Dream Deferred, you gotta get Great Debater, you gotta get older reasonable doubt, you gotta get Bower Brothers. It's a lot of shit, like you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, so, <laughs> You know, so it's it's all over the place, man. Like, but that's the beauty of a catalog. That's the beauty of having a great catalog that stands the test of time. That you could do that. People could. It ain't no one joint. It's not like, yo, this is the one album you gotta go get. If nothing, nah. There's people that's like, yo, Easy Truth, yo, music for my friends, yo, in celebration of us, yo, all the brilliant things, yo, Retropolitan, yo, Life and Tape, yo, a Dream Deferred. Like, it's like, oh wow, okay, that's like going to a restaurant. And everything on the menu, yo, you got to try that. But then you got to try that too. But you know what? You got to try that. Yo, tomorrow we're going to come back and then you're going to try that. It's like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> this restaurant is dope. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if you go to a restaurant and everybody tells you to order one thing, they got one dope thing. You go to a restaurant and they can recommend everything and say, yo, everything at this restaurant is great no matter what you order. That's when you got a hell of a restaurant. And that's what yeah. I've tried every album on where every song is like a different dish. And then with my catalog, every album is like a different dish. And you're like, yo, you can pick up whatever you want. You're going to love it. The Sports Walk is back. Watch season three of Backpack Broadcasting's original web series that brings you the opinions of real sports fans. The first two seasons and current season are available now for viewing on the Sports Walk YouTube channel and Facebook page. Check out the 2017 NYC WebFest official selection and see what other sports fans have to say on the hottest issues in sports today. It's easy. Just take the Sports Walk. Know we got to talk some Knicks. You know we yeah. got to talk some basketball. You came on my show, the NBA Exchange. We talked about the Knicks. What what you'd like to possibly see him do this off season? Uh, but that was a different time because they were still playing in the first round. Uh, right. Now that the season's over, um, we're settling a bit. The draft is coming up. Let's start with the draft first. Knicks have picks nineteen and twenty one. What would you like to see them do in the draft? Is it move up? Is it take two first rounders? What would you like to see them address in this draft? Taking two first rounders would be dope. I think there's two gaping holes um, in the starting lineup that they could fulfill with both of those first round picks. Or you could package all four of those picks, the two first round and the two second round, and move up for one stellar first round pick. Because the thing is, first of all, that's what's going to happen because they're not going to take four rookies at all. Mm -hmm. Um, If they did, it would be a stash in overseas type thing. And I don't think Leon is that kind of guy. I know like Phil would do that a lot in different regimes. I don't think Leon is that kind of guy. They're not taking four rookies. They can't even do it contractually. Like, they're already maxed out on players, you know, cap-wise. Like, they got tons of cap room, but they got to use that a certain way. They're not taking four rookies. They will be moving up. Um, If they take two rookies, there's a lot of options, man. I really like Trey Mann. Um, James Booknight is insane. I heard he went stupid in his combine the other day. I heard he lost his mind. (laughs) Yep. <laughs> it's going to put him out of contention. Like you, you read the reports that he wants to be here because he's from here. You know, he's um he's from Crown Heights. 
Yep. And that he, he made it clear to them. I read somewhere that he made it clear to them that he's from New York. And that was his way of saying, I want to be here. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, him just being like, yo, you know, I'm from New York, right? You know, I'm from New York, right? But don't forget I'm from New York. You know what I mean? So, like, you know, um, that would be fantastic. I like Moses Moody a lot. Um, I like Chris Duarte a lot. I think he's underrated, and I think he's going to go off because he's already older. People be afraid of older rookies. I'm not afraid of that because some of the greatest players ever in the greatest eras ever, like the 80s and the 90s, these guys mm -hmm. played four years of college, man. You know what I mean? Like Mike did three years. Tim Duncan did four years. You know, Barkley did three. Like these guys, they didn't leave after a year. So why are we afraid of kids coming out at 21? That's insane. Like 21 is a baby. Like that's insane. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like so looking at these guys 21, 22 years old, like they, you know, senior citizens is really ignorant, you know? Um, so, you know, I, I like Chris Duarte a lot. I think he could be, he could do damage. Um, they got to get a point. And and they, and they got to get a sniper in the starting lineup. I think we might have talked about this before. They got to yeah. get a sniper in that starting lineup, man. That's that's what's holding them back. Now, whether it's at the two and they move RJ up to the three, or they leave him at the two and they get a three who's a sniper, a Corey Kispert or something like that. They got to get a sniper in that starting lineup. Or if it's through the free agency or the trade, somebody in that starting lineup got to be a forty percent three point shooter, without a doubt. If you it's know? a guy, if it's if it's like a Kispert or a Boo Knight, like you said, who's shown out at his workouts i think mm -hmm. uh producer greg said 19 straight made threes yeah. uh, he's i've seen projections where he could be late lottery if if i if you knew that you could go get him late lottery in the knicks are you taking your two picks and moving up to go get yeah, him Yeah, because i don't think he drops that low i think especially yeah. after the combine i don't think he dropped i think he's going top 10 you think he's going top mm -hmm. 10 yeah, i think he's going with that kind of workout 19 straight i think he's going top 10 and then you know you got your agents who's supposed to make sure everybody knows that and put turn the volume up on that, which is great, you know. So I think he's going top ten, at least definitely top twelve. Like he he won't last. He he won't be there by nineteen. Um, you'd have to move up. I think somebody like him, Moses Moody. There's got to be a way to use one of those first round picks and those other two picks to move up and then still keep the other first round pick. You know, if they could get a Trey Man and a wing, I think they did great. If they because Trey Mann is vicious. If they could get somebody like Trey Mann and a Moses Moody or a James Booknight or uh Chris Duarte, there's a lot of guys. Um, I, I think they'll be vicious, you know. So they, they got work to do, but they've been the master finesses so far, man. They they finesse the hell out of some things, man. Like they've proven they are the kings of finesse. So we'll see how this goes. Brock Aller and 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 Leon and them and West, they've been finessing some things for the past year. So We'll see how it goes, but they got to get a sniper in that starting lineup. Yeah, well, that's the point. Finesse everything, think, for real. I think yeah. because they just made the playoffs, there's even a world that they don't have either first-round pick and just try to trade, like try to use them in the offseason and things of that nature. Yo, we we got to go get Brad Beal. So <laughs> okay, mm. so that, that answers – because I I've been saying for, I don't know, a couple months now with Dexter and I have talked about this – that they should really target Lonzo Ball harder than pretty much anybody else in terms of like, you know, who that. they can get in free agency. That I doesn't agree. mean they can't also get Bradley Beal. It just, you know, makes things complicated, whatever. But, and right. sure, New Orleans is going to want to execute a sign and trade maybe so that they don't just lose Lonzo Ball for nothing. But there's a guy think, from France that could fit perfectly on that plane. Send him out. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> No, I'm talking about. Yo, Scott, yo, Scott, this that, is that, a plane ticket to well, New Orleans what? with his name right on it. Well, yo, he's uh, a free agent. He's a restricted free agent. So. Restricted. We'll restrict him to the plane. <laughs> yo, him Scott, to I, thought you, I thought you were going to want him back, Scott. I thought you wanted the Frenchman back. Good boy, Frenchman Smokes. That. Wait, You've been me a long time. You knew better than that. <laughs> over here, what, what, what they call it? You're over here trolling. You knew better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so let me ask you this, though. Uh, one, on the Lonzo Ball point, because I think that is the perfect – if he's allowed to, like, actually be a point me guard too. and me be too. what they brought him in for, me because too. now he has a three-point shot, and I feel like mm -hmm. he would be perfect with RJ, Randall, share some of those responsibilities, and you could sort of develop and see where that goes. That wouldn't be the only move that they get, but I think no, that no, could not be – at all, but I think it's extremely important. I think yeah, they didn't get – Somebody like a Chris Paul, which I'm 50-50 on for this reason. Um, he's been playing incredibly well. He's been doing a million and one things. Um, 
I mean, out the West, I'm definitely pushing for them to go to the finals, you know, so for, for yeah. Phoenix to go to the finals. So he's been doing incredibly well. And having somebody like him train some point guards on the roster would be exponential. It would be crazy. You know, like it would be everything. At the same time, you're dealing with, okay, where it is, he's going to want three years. Well, he's already 36. So you're going to pay for 37, 38, 39. Mm. You're looking at when T-Mac was on the Knicks. You're looking at, you know, like when Jason Kidd was on the Knicks. Like, you know what I mean? You're looking at those types of things. And you got to be careful putting that much money up, 33 or 35 mil a year, like for that at that age. You know, you're really paying for some serious IQ and intelligence and all that. Um you got to be careful with that, you know, but he's incredible. He, he's been doing incredible and, and man, it would, it would be a dream come true. But is, are you going to get Phoenix Chris Paul for three more years? If you sign him, I don't know. So now if you don't do that, who do you get? Well, at that point, you know, I'm all about Lonzo. Lonzo's only like 23. Him and Julius are very, very good friends from when they was on the Lakers. Like they were super tight. People don't really know. They were super tight when they was on the Lakers. I think they still really tight. So you got that connection already. Um, and, and the timeline works, his age, his experience. He's young, but he's been in the league four years already, four or five years, but he's only 23. Yep. Perfect. You know, so he loves the open floor. His handle was right. He's six six. He plays defense. He locks down on defense. His three-point shot has gotten better. It's only going to continue to get better because once you see improvement, it's like somebody working out when they go to the gym and they see one muscle, forget it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> when you see one muscle pop, like, oh, shit, word, look at that. You taking selfies and you back in the gym. That's all you right. do. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I got this muscle though. You know what I mean? That's it. So <laughs> you look at him, he's seeing the improvement of shooting a thousand jumpers a day. Why would he not shoot another thousand every day? You know what I mean? Like, then he sees what his brother's doing and how his brother's taking over the world. And he's like, yeah, that's my little brother. I got to whip his ass. You know what I'm saying? Like, Word. <laughs> and live in the gym. So I think it will be perfect. And being in a market like New York, being in the biggest market, it will be perfect. You know? Um, I think he makes a ton of sense. And I think anybody saying otherwise doesn't really read the game. Now, it just depends on the money you're going to give him. You know, it really just depends on what you could work out. But I think he would be absolutely perfect for us. And then, but now you still need your sniper. You still need your sniper on the wing. You know, you need somebody who heads are scared of when they got that rock. But Chris Middle, whatever, like heads are scared. Like, the more he get it, it might be a three ball. We got to lock him up. Because that's how you're going to get Julius open and RJ open. And that's how you're going to get all that. Like, you need a knockdown, dead eye, Will Smith, Gemini man sniper. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you need that guy. I think, I think uh, Malcolm Brogdon got four for 85, and Fred Van Vliet got something along those lines, maybe four for 90. So I think Lonzo probably gets something in that territory. I, I maybe a little wants, more because he's younger. I think he wants 20 per at least. At least. Yeah. Which yeah. is crazy, which is kind of crazy. You know what I mean? But. <laughs> It depends on how you work in the rest of that cap space out. 20 per, 20 for Lonzo might be a little wild, but at the same time, I get it. You know, I get it. And I think he would be worth it depending on the rest of the roster and how you flesh it out. Because the thing with building these rosters that a lot of people don't realize is you got to play up to what heads do and don't do. Like you look at, you know, when Allen Iverson was on the Sixers, the reason why they were so successful is because they knew what he could do and they knew what he couldn't do. So mm. they just got a bunch of people who did what he couldn't do. And that's that's genius. You know, like that's what they didn't do with Melo. That's what they didn't do with, you know, with certain players out there. Like, yo, you didn't play up to what this guy needed and what he didn't need. You gave him more of the same. Like if you come into the house, yo, having a barbecue, you need me to bring everything. Well, yeah, I got a bunch of beers, so, you know, don't bring that. And then you bring a 24-pack of Corona. Like, bro, I told you I had mad beers. Like, why'd you bring that? Like, that's exactly what heads are doing, which is stupid. So if they do it the opposite way and play up to what we don't have, Lonzo makes perfect sense. We don't have somebody in the open floor like him who thinks he's baby Jason Kidd and is just whipping passes everywhere. Like, that's what heads need, you know? So I love it, man. I love it. So. Scott, let me ask you this last thing before we get you up out of here. I know you got to get out of here, but um, what would be, because this was, you know, 41 wins this year, pretty successful season. Nobody saw it coming. You and I spoke about that. No. Nobody really saw this coming at all. What I know it's a long way to go, and we don't know the moves they're going to make, but what are you looking for as a Nick fan in terms of next year and how successful that would be? Is there a number of wins? Is it advancing further in the playoffs? What does next year look like in terms of success as a Nick fan? I think playoff spot is the bare minimum because they've already done it. Anything less, 
you dropped off from last year, you know? Mm. So um, playoff spot for sure. I want a roster that people are really afraid of, you know? This year was a Cinderella season, and it was a surprise. It was a surprise. Nobody saw it coming and nobody really paid any attention to it until it was too late for people. And it was like, damn, they got the fourth seed. Oh, shit. You know, but you want a roster that Heads is afraid of. You want Heads to see that and be like, yo, we got to play the Knicks tonight. Damn. All right. Because that's how it was in, um, what was that, the 12-13? Yeah. 12-13 season? Yeah, 12-13 season. Heads yep. was afraid of us. Heads was afraid of us. You go back to them tapes, them ESPN first takes and all that. <laughs> We, we was the number two. We were the second seed in the East. Second seed. 54, 54 wins. Back yeah. Then. Second seed in the East. Heads was afraid of us. Leo, we got to play the Knicks tomorrow. Ah, damn. That's what I want. I want uh, that. Like in the 90s and like the 12, 13 season, like heads being afraid of that roster and rightfully so. Not just because it looked crazy on paper, but because, yo, know, we saw them play the first 15 games of the season. Them all was going wild. They're going wild. They got Julius. They got. Lonzo, they kept RJ, you know, they brought Derrick Rose back. And that's Beal somehow. I'm, I'm just making up things in the air. Like, yo, they got roster. They got Miles Turner. They got Frankie yeah. Smokes. Yeah, you know. No, don't have Frankie. Don't, don't have Frankie <laughs> Smokes. Yo. Man, they got real Frank Smokes. They got roster like that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. No, no, no. I think, I think that absolutely would be uh, a successful year, man. But, you know, we're going to pay attention through the offseason. You know, we're going to be – Connecting in touch uh, for sure. Uh, much blessings to you, your family, everything you're doing. For people who don't know, all the brilliant things out now. Go purchase that. You don't got to stream that. Go out purchase and really it. support Sky. Sky has always yeah. talked about that when Word he's come up, up here. So um, really support that, Sky. And hopefully, you know, once you get back to doing some more shows, we connect, we see you again. But uh, much blessings to you, brother. Thank you for joining us once again on the pod. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. And, um, you know, keep it going, man. Much love. Yeah, much love. So for this episode 184 of the A Hotel Podcast, that's our guy Sky Zoo, Brian Fonseca. I'm Dexter Henry. Until next time, y'all. Peace.